Welcome to the future and you. Ideas and opinion about the future based on verifiable facts of today. This episode is for April 27, 2016. I am your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. Our guest today is Timothy Botman, a professional network security analyst and master of information security. Today's topics include, if quantum computers become publicly available and are as powerful as we are told they will be, all of everyone's past encrypted secrets will be revealed to anyone who wishes to read them. Emails, banking transactions, Silk Road purchases, and any money laundering that's hidden within the Bitcoin blockchain. Future encryptions will be secure, at least for a while, but every previously encrypted file and document that is findable within the open internet will be laid bare. If you have ever done something that you shouldn't and you are counting on encryption to keep your secret forever, you need to think again. Also, just how accurate is the computer hacking on the TV show Mr. Robot? Methods hackers use to get your password, how little protection is provided by fully encrypted hard drives, why the hardest part of the computer security profession is securing the human, and the browser named Opera has announced that it will include VPN, virtual private network, as a default feature. And so I offer my speculation that this may soon prompt all browsers to include VPN. And now, on to our interview. I am speaking as a private citizen mm -hmm. and also a master of information security. Okay. At nowhere. Do you get a cape with that? <laughs> <laughs> you missed my shirt today. I have, a, I have a shirt with a cape that oh, I was wearing. There you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Well, let me ask you serious questions. There's been some significant advances in quantum computing. If co quantum computers become practical and become production models, and computer power, uh, the ability to do crypto cryptographic, so to speak, breaking cryptography, increases in capacity, say, 100,000 times or millions of times faster than currently. Does that mean that all the current cryptography is, becomes invalid? What I'm getting at is they always talk about this code, this crypto is so strong it would take, you know, 50 million years to break it. Which it, is with the current computing power. Exactly. So if we can do 50 million years of current computing in a day, does that mean that the code is no longer any good? Yes. Okay. Does that mean that everything we have encoded in that code in the past, including all our old emails and all of our whatever it is, personal is information, all broken. is all broken tomorrow? So if somebody's storing it somewhere in some giant warehouse, which NSA, they are, then yes, all the secrets are out. They have uh, whenever they break that, then they can read everything that was encrypted with it. Okay. Uh, as far as quantum computing goes, I'm going to go ahead and preface this with, I don't know much about it, mm -hmm. but there's one part that was really interesting to me, quantum entanglement, where you have uh, two electrons, I think it was. You, you take the two electrons and you smash them together really hard, and they both become, one becomes the inverse of the other. So if you have an up over here, you have a down over here. So it doesn't matter how far apart you take those two, mm -hmm. if you change one, the other one changes. So, I've heard of this. Right, quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah. amazing. So it's it could be used for instantaneous point-to-point -point communications, at which point the encryption or the, the cryptography would be no, it wouldn't matter because there'd be no traveling from here to that next jump to the next jump to the next jump, at which point somewhere in there you get intercepted. Mm -hmm. You would set up however uh, in whatever Magical way hand waving. Be. Exactly. <laughs> Magical hand waving. Mm -hmm. uh, you punch in the person that you want to connect to's particle number. You create a direct link to them. So whenever you go to send your message... It doesn't go through any jumps. It goes from your computer uh, to their computer. With no point for interception. No point for interception. Okay. It goes from one particle flipping back and forth, sending ones and zeros, and the other computer is just receiving ones and zeros. That would be awesome. So you've got no chance for it to be intercepted. Mm -hmm. But that's not ready for prime time right now. Not even close. <laughs> okay. 
I think the last I saw on it, they uh, they did a uh, an experiment where they were able to get the the two particles like five meters from each other, mm -hmm. and then they were able to test it once because after it was measured, it was no longer a valid. It, but it's at least that's proof proof of concept. They did a proof of concept of it. Okay. Okay. So it is a uh, characteristic of quantum entanglement that mm -hmm. could be used for this purpose. Okay, okay. I had reported on my show, just based on my own opinion, the first part you said. Yeah, all past encryption would be broken, basically. Have you seen the TV show Mr. Robot? Have you seen every episode? I have. More than once. Oh my god, I love this. <laughs> I love Mr. Robot. Okay. And I can't wait for season two to come out. Mm-hmm. Coming out very soon. Okay. The obvious question, how accurate is this show? Fairly. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the tools and uh, terminology they use. Mm -hmm. All right. First of all, comparing it to any other Hollywoodized hacking movie, TV show, mm -hmm. whatever, it is, it is on point. In one of the scenes, they actually use a real tool called uh, Nmap, a uh, network mapping tool. And during one of the shots, you see them using actual commands for Nmap. Uh, most of the stuff they're doing in there is real stuff. They mentioned uh, in one of the episodes, whenever they were trying to uh, infect the network at the police station, they dropped a virus on there. And the police station's uh, antivirus picked it up almost immediately. Which was a vast. Right. <laughs> it was, which means that uh, the one that they were using was absolutely terrible because of it was caught by. And a he vast. asked the guy, the, the woman that had written it, what? You, when? Since when did you become a script kitty? Yeah. He says, "What did you just pull that off of Exploit DB, <laughs> which is a actual website you can go to to pull down mm -hmm. um, viruses and." It's there for testing of, uh, uh, I'm making air quotes right now, it's there mm -hmm. for testing of antivirus and uh, making sure that what you have will stop these particular... In other words, it's um, it known exploits that have already been baked into all the antivirus software. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's not, it's not custom, it's not good, it's not going to be mm -hmm. effective. And her excuse was, of course, she had only one hour. Right. To so prepare you've seen something. it. <laughs> yes, I have. I've seen every episode, but only once. Yeah. <laughs> um, my follow-up question to that, though, is, yes, the show seems to be accurate, but I'm, I'm wondering if a lot of the accuracy or, or perceived accuracy, even though I'm not saying it's inaccurate, but I'm saying is a lot of it simply that they don't explain everything to people. They don't pretend that you don't know this stuff. It's, it's like treating the viewer as though you're an insider too, and you'll understand everything. Like, they never said, explained what is a script kitty, although I already knew. And if, when you see the screen with Nmap on it, you already know, and they don't explain it. And so they're feeding the stuff to you too fast to explain everything, but the insiders will know, and they'll say, oh, yeah, they're one of us. <laughs> yeah. And I'm wondering if it's there's a lot of that going on. It's not just that it's accurate, but that viewers are enjoying it because they're feeling like they're part of the inside. Well, yeah, I'm thinking a lot of it has to do with, like, uh, people might pick up on uh, terminology or something like script kitty. So I think as far as uh, what it is that makes the show great is whenever you have shows like NCIS or any of the other ones I haven't watched that do terrible computer crimes, mm. um, they just, the, the writers don't seem to care to do any kind of, uh, any kind of research because for the most part, people aren't going to want to see somebody pounding away in a terminal. You know, they're not going to want to see somebody punching keys and sending commands into a terminal, which is what, like, 99% of hacking is. It's just not visually dramatic. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to make that something that Hollywood can sell. Mm. But the fact that these guys who made Mr. Robot actually took the time, and instead of having them say just random generic hey, I think I heard this buzzword somewhere online before. How did you trace their IP address? Oh, I created a script in Visual Basic. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, it's just, that's trash. 
but mm-hmm. these guys they they either have uh, worked in the field in the past or they just did really good research and it added another level of entertainment to me mm-hmm. that's that's how I see it. Mm-hmm. it it made it more interesting whenever I see them using tools that I recognize it mm-hmm. just it, it intrigued me a bit more mm-hmm. and because you work in security all the time have you spotted flaws in the show any actual errors not any errors per se i wasn't really looking that hard for them mm-hmm. however i imagine they would have jumped out at you if they were there though yeah also it's i mostly just wanted to see the good in the show mm. because uh they had me since episode one mm. and it was just uh i was sold Mm-hmm. And then I just started noticing it was like finding Easter eggs whenever you'd see something that you know you recognized in the show that you just wouldn't see anywhere else mm-hmm. in TV or in the movies. Um, but uh, it did seem like some of their, uh, I mean, it had to be this way because otherwise, like you said, people would get bored. Uh, but whenever they were doing the social engineering, it all just fell together too easy for them. Mm. Whenever they were trying to break into, uh, was it Iron Mountain? And this, they were able to look up this person's Facebook and then they found out that like they had somebody in the hospital and uh, all this other stuff. It, it fit too easy. It's like the writers needed it out to get through it really quick. But, I mean, aside from that, like mm-hmm. what you have to write in order to keep a, a plot going. Mm. Yeah, no, it was pretty on point. Okay, okay. Uh, I want to ask you about encrypted drives. Now, I've noticed that uh, Linux Mint offers in during the install you the, you the option to encrypt your entire drive. Mm-hmm. What form of protection is that? Does if someone if you're sitting at your computer, uh, your computer and you're working within that drive, meaning that uh, presumably it's not encrypted while you're working with it, is it still a protection for you, or is it only a protection for you if somebody steals your computer? Yeah, it's only a protection if somebody steals your computer. Whenever you log into it, whenever you start it up the first time, you have to put in whatever your password is to unencrypt it. That way, if somebody was to steal your computer or even just your hard drive, you know how you can take, uh, like what we were doing earlier, trying to move some files from mom's computer off of her hard drive running Windows, and we use Linux to access that. We use the Linux bootable thumb drive Mm -hmm. to get to her Windows hard drive. And we were able to pull all the files and everything out of there. If the Windows drive had been encrypted, then we would not be able to have access to that. So it only goes into effect if your if your hard drive is not in use. Okay. If you are working on your computer and your login, it requires a password. If someone's hacking into your machine, does that provide you any protection from them, or is it only from someone who's trying to log into your computer? at the beginning of a session. Is this still on the encryption, the encrypted hard drive, um, or just like... Well, let's say it's not an encrypted one. Okay. It's just a Windows login. You know, you're starting up, you're sitting down at your computer, you're going to start using it, and it asks for your username, and it asks for your password. That password, is that a protection for you from some when someone's hacking in, or is it only if someone tries to initiate a session on your computer? And that password does not involve any encryption either, does it? The drive's yeah, not no, encrypted. Yeah, no, that's just... Uh, that's... Just a gate. You, mm-hmm. everything's still open on the other side if it's not encrypted. But you can. Uh, so does that password provide you any protection beyond that one? Opening up the session, the beginning of the session. Uh, no, that's really all that's provided there. Is uh, okay. It's used for authentication, just to say. I am who I say I am. Okay. And if we take that same drive, but we're not in a session, we pull it out of the computer and stick it into another computer and boot off of the, the that computer's drive, not off the drive we just stuck into it, can the person or can you then read everything that's on that drive and never have to enter a uh, user password or any kind of uh, anything, any hindrance? Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can you can read everything that's on there. Okay. Okay, let me ask you about passwords. Uh, there's all the internet is full of people telling you to make a good password. There's password tips and password pointers. Passwords uh, are one of my uh, one of my favorites. Is it really? Yeah. Um, I love passwords. I love strong passwords. Mm-hmm. 
I understand this is something that's burning a hole in your heart. <laughs> if you would, spill your guts. <laughs> what is it you really you tell people over and over, and you want them to understand, and we're going to record right through the noise, as <laughs> I'll move closer. What is it you really want people to know about passwords? Okay. What's your sermon? So. Where to begin? Oh, my God. I know, right? <laughs> First of all, okay. use a password manager. Mm -hmm. LastPass, OnePass. Uh, pass. There's offline ver or offline uh, password manager called KeePass. Mm -hmm. But if you need something that goes between your phone and your computer and is automatically backed up, I, I would suggest using like LastPass or OnePass. Uh, it makes it a lot easier. So. The reason why you have to have a password manager is because passwords are hard. Humans are not good at remembering random characters pushed together uh, at, with 16 different digits or 16 characters. It's just, it's not something a human can do. And if you don't have a randomly generated 16 character password, using uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and special characters, then your password is not... It's it's not as secure as you would hope it is. Mm -hmm. um, One of the difficulties people have nowadays for passwords is everywhere you go, they want you to sign up and join their thing. Whether it's, you know, it's not just your bank. It's not just, you know, your login at Facebook. I mean, everybody. Yeah, any wants website you. you go to these days, they're Newspapers, like... Newspapers, magazines, everybody and their yeah. brother wants you to make another password. Yeah, they say sign up at our site. Mm -hmm. And that's where the big issue comes in. Because if you're using one password, if you're using, you know, water bottle, one, two, three, and you use that for every site that you go to, mm -hmm. you have that for your Google account, you have that for your Yahoo email, you have that for your bank, you have that for... Any other what your Verizon phone service, and then you also have that for your Hello Kitty blog. Then, if they compromise your Hello Kitty blog, which is the weakest point in that chain, and they get your password of water bottle one two three, they're gonna use that and they're gonna try it on every other site they can find, mm -hmm. and then they're gonna own your Google account, mm -hmm. your Yahoo email, your bank account. Your Verizon account using the same password for any two sites is a terrible, terrible thing. And that is where password managers come in. Mm -hmm. You have one password that you use. Use your use your water bottle one, two, three. But you know, maybe add some special characters in there, capitalize like the A's and water bottle and uh, I don't know. Mix it up. But you only have the one password you have to remember. And then you use the random password generator for any other site that you go to log into. Anytime a site asks you to create a new password, you go to that password manager, you press generate random password of 16 characters, and then you just copy and paste that in wherever it has to go. And you don't have to remember it because that's what the password manager is there for. Seriously, the, the password managers need to be a staple on everybody's computer, the, the value that comes from using a password manager cannot be overstated. I, I've seen too many people during my career who will have a, uh, a, a sticky note or a, a notebook, and even with the sticky note or the notebook or even a text file, like a .txt file on their desktop containing usernames and passwords, mm -hmm. they still have this different usernames for whatever's required, but then for the password, they'll have it be like their name or their kid's name or their dog's name or their spouse's name and then, or your favorite football team. Like that information can be found. Like, if I'm trying to get into somebody's account, the first thing I'm going to do is find out what email addresses they have, what what do they have, okay, let's go find their Facebook, and let's start pulling out keywords. And then you use those in combination with other special characters, and you can set up a script to just keep poking at websites with uh, these credentials until one of them works. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. And it's it's not a hard thing to do. I've also heard that uh, passwords that are made up of words, there was a time when they might have been good, but um, hackers can download gigantic dictionary, basically. There's a, a just a big listing of words. Rainbow that, tables. Yeah, and they include pretty much all the words in the English language, along with variations that have been used in passwords, such as password123. Yep, and, and they'll also have any kind of, uh, anytime a site is compromised and they get a password dump from the site, like a... Whenever, uh, what was it? I can't remember. I think it was Ashley Madison. They got like 200 and something thousand unique passwords added to uh, their rainbow table. That you just you just keep populating this rainbow table, and then you're gonna find somebody who matches. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a, a very vague question that has a probably a simple answer, pr right. preferably very short answer. Have you seen security um, well, breakdowns, I'll call it, in security that were pointed out but were not addressed, have not been fixed? And what I'm going for here is a lot of money is spent on security. Um, and I'm wondering how much of it is um, really they're, they're following up on what they're paying for. Is most of the time they, they're diligent and they do what's needed? to follow through on the, the things, the changes that are needed to, uh, to be done? Or sometimes, how often is it lacking? I guess that's what I'm going for. So this is not within my company. Certainly. However, uh, there are uh, bug hunters who will find issues within uh, uh, applications, security flaws, and they will report them to the company that published the application and the company will uh, sit on that for a long time hmm. before they decide to do anything about that uh, issue. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the bug hunters will, uh, will say, well, that's fine. You just do whatever you want to do with that. Whenever you finally release a fix for it, then I'll announce my findings and other times they'll say, the bug hunter will say, uh, well, you better hurry up and patch that because uh, I'm going live on my blog tomorrow. Mm. So uh, as far as your question goes, I don't know how that's tied together. Mm -hmm. but uh, It sounds related. <laughs> it felt like it was somehow related. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that I haven't asked you about security that, uh, that you'd like to mention? A concern you have in the industry or, or with people's behavior, especially maybe the consumer's behavior? It said in, uh, in the security field that the hardest part is securing the human because you can have the most fortified firewalls and the most hardened servers and make it so your DMZ is just locked down and your internal network is not soft and gooey. <laughs> but all it takes is one person, one phishing email, uh, one uh, associate to go and download that new, uh, I don't know, who's a popular musical artist these days? Justin Bieber uh, <laughs> soundtrack? A double virus then. Right? <laughs> And uh, once they're compromised, if, if somebody gets in to the company through that, then it doesn't matter how hard your walls are. They're inside. They have the rights of whomever they infected. So hopefully your uh, network engineers are not fans of Justin Bieber mm. because that might mm -hmm. end terribly. Okay. Okay. But yes, the, the hardest issue is always, the hardest problem is always going to be securing the humans. Mm -hmm. You have to you have to train them, and, and then even after that, you just have to hope that they take in what it is you say. This has been a recurring theme on Mr. Robot. Many times they've used social engineering to to bypass the technical problems they would otherwise have to sort of brute force their way through. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. Social engineering is always the easiest route to go. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than breaking that AES encryption, mm -hmm. just watch over the person's shoulder and whenever they put in the password for it, just get the password. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was a, uh, uh, an XKCD uh, 
comic that came out a while back. It was uh, it was two panels next to each other, and in the left panel it says, uh, "Oh no, they used AES encryption. It's it's uh, 1024 bit, and there's there's no way we're ever gonna get this cracked. We'll have to build some kind of supercomputer in order to break this uh, break this encryption." And then on the next panel it says, uh, "How it would really go is." Oh no, they've got this super encryption on here. Here's a wrench. Go hit him in his kneecaps until he tells you what the password is. Uh, okay. <laughs> so it's always easier to uh, to bypass the, the technology than try to brute force it. Because uh, okay. technology is hard, mm -hmm. but people are soft. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I appreciate you taking the time for the interview. <laughs> no problem. That was Timothy Botman. A few days ago, Opera announced that they were going to integrate into their browser as a default feature uh, VPN, uh, Virtual Private Network, which is a privacy feature. Uh, many people use a VPN to make all of their online communications more private. Some want privacy against hackers and criminals. Others are more worried about government surveillance. During the interview, I asked Timothy about if he had heard that Opera was going to offer VPN, I wanted his opinion. But he had not heard it, and so he had nothing to say. Afterwards, he sent me an email providing a lot more information and uh, mentioning a few, a few magazine articles. The key thing that he pointed out was that the VPN that will be offered from Opera, which currently is in its uh, developer's version and is soon to be rolled out for, um, for all users, is that the VPN encrypts and protects only the information that a user sends inside the Opera browser. In other words, if you read your email online, you go to Facebook online, through all through the browser, everything you do through the browser would be protected. However, anything you do outside the browser, for example, if you use Skype, that is not included in the VPN, and so it's not protected. When I first heard about this uh, offering from Opera of a VPN, uh, as a default feature. My first impression was that this could be a, uh, a major trend that would spread to other browsers and basically become a universal feature of all browsers. This was, of course, based on my first impression that this would be a universal panacea and not simply something that would be limited to the browser. Now, looking forward into the future, it is still possible that it could become a universal feature of all browsers even though it's not a complete solution for a person who is concerned about their privacy, because even though it doesn't cover all avenues of possible information leakage to uh, malicious hackers and such of a person's information, so much of what a person does is actually done through the browser that it's really the main method that hackers use, say, if you're in a unsecured public Wi-Fi at the library or a cafe, or at Starbucks, or at McDonald's, if you're in a, an unsecure environment like that, most of what people do there is through the browser. And so by giving them the encryption they need in the one tool they use the most, the browser, it could still be a very effective tool for protecting people. And to offer it as a default feature within a browser might very well give that browser an advantage over its competition. And if one browser has an advantage over the competition, other browsers would naturally want to pick up that feature too and offer it to their end users. And so it may still spread throughout all the browsers. I think it's a reasonable thing to expect for the future. It's not a certainty, but it's reasonable. I'll include a link in the show notes to one of the articles that he mentions. That's it for this episode of The Future and You. This program is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivative Works 2.5 license. A copy of this license may be viewed at creativecommons.org. Briefly, this means you may, indeed you are encouraged to, copy this entire program as many times as you wish and give it away to as many people as you wish. But you may not copy only a portion of this program, you may not charge anyone any amount of money for it, and you may not use any portion of it to make something new. On the other hand, anyone whose obvious goal is to recommend the show to others automatically gets special dispensation. 
offline reviews, which include the show's website, may include brief quotes. And online reviews, such as for a blog or community group or web page, which provide a conspicuous link to the show's website, may use as many quotes as they wish, up to and including a transcript of one half of any interview. The show's theme music is a blues number called Some Sympathy by Chris Jurgensen, and is from his album Big Bad Sun, which is available at magnatune.com. Magnatune is an independent record label that sells its catalog of music through online downloads and print-on-demand CDs. The company allows artists to retain full rights to their music and splits equally with an artist all the revenue from the sale of their work. All the music at Magnatune may be previewed free of charge and customers can even choose how much they want to pay for the music with pricing ranging from $5 to $18 per album. You can learn more about them at magnatune.com that's spelled M-A-G-N-A-T-U-N-E dot com. If you have a theory or opinion about what the future will contain, be it the near future or the far future, you may email it to me at thefutureandyou.com. That's M-E at symbol thefutureandyou.com. You may also suggest topics that you would like to hear discussed or send contact information for experts that you feel might provide valuable insights into the future. Mind you, an expert is not necessarily someone with an impressive degree. The best experts are the people who live or work or strive in the area under discussion. If the subject is science or medicine or academia, a degree is important. But if the discussion concerns trends in construction or firefighting or video gaming, a degree is pretty much meaningless. To get the inside dope, you've got to find the people who actually do this stuff every day. They are the first to see the trends because the trends have already begun changing their lives. As to the topics we will explore in the next episode of The Future and You, I can make no guarantees. Interviews are still being sought, recorded, and edited. All I can promise is that we will ruminate on the future. To learn more, check the show's website at thefutureandyou.com. If you enjoyed the program, please mention it to a friend, and be sure to join me again next time. Until then, I have been your host, Stephen Ewan Cobb. On behalf of myself and all my guests, I thank you for listening.